It's just really a privilege for me to come up and be with you from San Antonio, Texas. Made the long drive, and here we are. Um, I love Jack. I do. I think his heart has been such an inspiration to so many of us for so many years. I'll never forget a few years ago, I had some some health issues that were somewhat serious. And um, I got a phone call from him. And I can tell you exactly where I was when the call came. I said, how did How did you even know about this? And he took time to call just to encourage me and to tell me that he was thinking of me and and praying for me. That meant so very, very much. So I loved coming to see you. I hope if you're ever in San Antonio, you'll come to the Oak Hills Church and and say hello to us. And uh, maybe you shouldn't all come at one time, but but, uh, I'd love, love to have you come. I'm so excited because my wife is on this trip. My wife is on this trip. She has to listen to me preach all the time, and she came anyway. And so I'm really, really grateful. I asked her. I said, honey, maybe you could help me pick out the jokes for this message because I've I've been uh, to Preston Wood now several times. I'm afraid I'm telling the same jokes over and over again. And and so I don't know, maybe you've heard these, but these, if you don't like them, you take it out on my wife. (laughs) My favorite joke these days is the story of a couple who were celebrating their 30th wedding anniversary. Both of them were 60 years of age. Have you heard this? God was so proud of this couple, she's 60, he's 60, married 30 years, that he got word to them whatever they prayed that day he would do. So she said, oh, Lord, I've always wanted to go to the Caribbean. Poof, just like that, two tickets appeared in her hand. (laughs) Well, he looked over and he said, now this is working. He said, well, you know, Lord, I've always wanted to be married to someone who's 30 years younger than I am. Poof, he was 90 years old. I noticed the women really liked that (laughs) joke. These two preachers went to a preaching seminar, young pastors just getting started, and they were listening to these other fellows who had been around the block a time or two get up and share some of their favorite messages. And the message that morning was brought by a pastor who said, I'm going to share my favorite Mother's Day message. And he began the sermon by saying, the best years of my life were spent in the arms of another man's wife. And then he paused and he said, my mother And so the young preacher turned to his buddy, the young preacher, and said, now that's how you start a sermon, right there. That's an attention grabber. I'm going to use that next Mother's Day. And his buddy said, now listen, that's a tricky sentence. (laughs) You don't want to mess that one up. You better write it down. He said, oh, no, I've got it right here. Well, the next Mother's Day, the young preacher stood up in front of his church and said, the best years of my life were spent in the arms of another man's wife. Then he paused and he said, for the life of me, I can't remember who she was. (laughs) Preaching's not easy, is it? It's sure good to be at church, isn't it? It's a good time. It's good to be with people of faith because these really are scary, scary times. I've been doing a lot of travel over the last couple of months. And somebody asked me the other day, what, what are you picking up as you travel around? I just said, I think we're scared. It's a scary time. I mean, we've, we've gone through times of economic unrest before, but this ISIS thing, these beheadings, and this talk about a worldwide plague, it's a... It's like living in a science fiction novel, isn't it? I think we need prayer more than ever before. I believe that we have only one solution, and that is Jesus Christ. I really do. I believe that the only response during times like this is prayer. I'm so grateful because I know you're a praying church. 
I'm going to do something on Monday, October 20th, and I wanted to tell you just a, a little bit about it. I've never done anything like this before. Just had the idea a few days ago, and that is to host an online prayer gathering where you log on to maxlocato.com and people from all over the world are being invited. It's kind of a global prayer half hour. We're just going to pray. We're going to pray about Ebola. We're going to pray about ISIS. We're going to pray about our country. You're going to be able to tweet your prayers or Facebook your prayers. And I don't know how it's going to work, but I thought it's worth a try. I just think we need to pray. So if you'd like to be a part of that 6 p.m. on Monday, October 20th, just go to my webpage and there it'll be. And we can all pray together. We need to pray, don't we? We really do. And so I want to talk to you for just a few moments about the power of a simple prayer. My wife, Deanalyn, and I uh, raised three daughters. They're all out of the house now. But even though they're grown, I still have a shudder in my soul, a shaking in my knees, when I see three words that do indeed strike fear in the heart of any mom, any dad. I bet you parents know exactly the words I'm talking about. Some assembly required. (laughs) All we wanted was a gift, right? And here we get a lifelong project. And so we sit up all night trying to get A to fit B and C to fit D and trying to get that bracket over there to fit this bolt over here. Inevitably, there is a piece that is missing, right? Have you ever had that happen? There is a piece that is missing. I think the devil does this. I think the devil has trained a team of gremlins to sneak into the living room and snatch up those bolts and those brackets when we're not looking. If you were to go to purgatory right now, you'd see a warehouse in which all of those missing bolts have been stored. Some assembly required. It's true with toys, it's true in life. Maybe marriage licenses should have those three words at the bottom, some assembly required. Maybe job applications should have, right before you sign your name, some assembly required to make this job work. I think babies should enter the world with a toe tag. <laughs> it says some assembly required. Life comes at us in pieces and life has a way of falling to pieces. I have a feeling that every one of you has an area of life in which you're just trying to make the pieces fit. Might be a relationship area, might be a financial area, might be an employment area, but you're just trying to get, just can't get all the pieces to line up. Is is there some part of your life, would you raise your hand if there's some part of your life where you're trying to get the pieces to fit? There you go. And that person that didn't, I've got a sermon on honesty that's really (laughs) trying to get A to fit B, B to fit C, just trying to get the pieces to line up. So here's a good question. When, When the pieces don't fit, how do you respond? Do you react in anger, in frustration? In impatience, do you respond in prayer? I'd like to say that I've always responded in prayer. But the truth of the matter is I have a confession to make, and that is I am a recovering prayer wimp. When I pray, my thoughts zig, and then they zag, and then they zig again. When I sit down to pray, I think of 101 things I want to do or need to do instead of the one thing that I really want to do, and that is pray. When I sit down to pray, distractions swarm on me like mosquitoes on a Texas night. I know some people who are members of the PGA, 
Prayer Giants Association. I am a card-carrying member of the PWA, Prayer Wimps Anonymous. Some people would rather pray than sleep. I struggled. Why do I tend to sleep when I pray? Prayer. Now, maybe you get prayer. Maybe prayer has always made sense to you or come easy to you, but you need to know for some of us it's a battle. I've wondered, why does God care what I think? Really, I mean, honestly, why would my thoughts matter to him? I can't get the cable company to call me back, much less God. (laughs) And then there's that issue of unanswered prayer. That part of us that says, well, I tried that before. Why keep tossing the coins of the longings of my heart into a silent pool? The problems and the paradox of prayer. And yet the repeated commands of the Bible. The most common command in the Bible is to pray. There's a whole book in the Bible dedicated to prayers. Every man and woman of God spent time in prayer. Jesus prayed. I stumbled across something here just a few years ago that has really revolutionized my prayer life. You notice I said I'm a prayer wimp, but I'm a recovering prayer wimp. I'm finding more energy these days than ever before in prayer. I'm enjoying time in prayer. I'm spending time in prayer. Here's what I did. I went through the Bible and I took all the prayers and realized that they would fit into one prayer. I took all of the prayers of the Bible, at least the ones that I could find. I'm sure I overlooked one somewhere. But I realized that they would fit into what I call a pocket prayer. Easy to manage, easy to remember. And I use this prayer to guide me in my prayers. Can I share this pocket prayer with you? Of course I can. I have the microphone. (laughs) It's very simple. Father... You are good. I need help. They need help. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. I just keep that prayer in my hip pocket. On my good days, it orbits, it floats in my mind. And I'm only a thought or two away from a phrase or two in that prayer. For most of us, prayer is not a 40-day retreat or a two-hour session. For most of us, prayer is this ongoing conversation with God as we're walking through the grocery store line, as we're stopping to pick up the kids on the way home, as we're stepping into the doctor's office or the meeting Father, we can say, Father, at any time during the day, Father, I'm just going to tell you you're good. Driving here through traffic, the traffic is bad, but you're good. The economy is bad, but you're good. The weather may be bad, but you're good. You're good. And because you're good, life has hope. Because you're good, I have hope. And the power of prayer depends not so much upon the power of my prayers as the one who hears the prayer. The power of the prayer depends on the one who hears it, not the one who says it. And because you're good, Father, because you're shot through with goodness, because every thought that you have is a good thought, and because every intention that you have for all of us is good, you only want good for your children. Oh, Lord, I declare that. You're good. And because you're my father and because you're good, I can just say I need help. 
And I just tell God where I need help. My health needs help, or my finances need help, or my, 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 my wisdom needs help. Whatever fits the need of the day, you're never without hope because you always have his help. I need help. They need help. My kids need help. My wife needs help. My husband needs help. Our country needs help. Our president needs help. Our church needs help. And you take the posture that is the most powerful and highest privilege of a Christian. You stand before God on behalf of somebody else. And before I say amen, Lord, I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you that my blessings truly do outweigh my burdens. Thank you, Lord, for all the good times you've blessed me with. Thank you for the friends I do have. Thank you for what hair I have left. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, by the power of Jesus, under the authority of Jesus, at the invitation of Jesus, I say amen. Amen. And for most of us, prayer is just that. It's cycling through these thoughts that God invites us to think. And many of us need a guide to, 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 to remind us that there is more to prayer than just a list of requests, though requests are wonderful. And what I've discovered is that there's really power in the simple prayer, the heartfelt prayer. One of the most powerful prayers is seldom considered a prayer in Scripture, but it is a prayer nonetheless, and it consisted of only four words. They have no wine. Does anybody know who offered that prayer? Mary did, the mother of Jesus. You remember the story. There was a wedding, and Jesus was there. John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. Isn't that great that Jesus was invited to a wedding? That he was likable enough, but that, that whenever they were compiling the list of, of attendees, one said to the other, the bride said to the groom, or vice versa, let's be sure and invite Jesus. He's such a nice person. Isn't it great that he was likable enough to be invited to a wedding? And isn't it great that he took time to go? Isn't it great that he stopped everything and he said, oh, if there's a wedding in Cana, let's go. And not only did he go, he took his followers with him. Maybe that's the reason they had the problem that they had. <laughs> because while they were at the wedding... There was a small crisis. Does anybody remember what the crisis was? Somebody underestimated the size of the crowd or the appetite of the guests or the depth of the wine vats or the number of friends, but whatever the reason, the bride and the groom ran out of wine. You ran out of patience. You ran out of Ideas, you ran out of money. Life leaks sometimes. We just run out. So what do we do when the pieces don't fit? Well, here's what Mary did. Mary, the mother of Jesus. For my nickel, she appears far too seldom in Scripture. Nobody asked me. But I would have included more Mary stories in the Gospels. After all, she carried Jesus in her womb for nine months. She nurse fed him for, breastfed him for at least that many and maybe more months. Who knew Jesus more than the mother of Jesus did? So when her stories, when her name appears in scriptures, we perk up. And it appears here. Maybe she was in charge of the wedding. Maybe she was helping to run the reception. 
We don't know, but for whatever reason, she felt responsible for the problem. And so here's what she did. The mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. They have no wine. On a scale of one to 10, 10 being eloquent, how would you rate that prayer? Could it be more simple? They have no wine. She did not say, O oh, thou great and wonderful provider of wine. It wasn't it. You, you wouldn't take this prayer and put it in a frame and hang it on your wall. It was a very simple statement of fact. They have no wine. She wasn't bossy. She didn't put conditions on the statement. She didn't say, now, if you don't do this, I won't believe in you. She didn't say, I'm your mother and you have to. She didn't tell him how to solve the problem. She didn't say, they have no wine. Here's what you need to do and here's when you need to do it. She took the problem and in my imagination, I see her just putting it in her hands, walking it across the room and taking it to Jesus. It's the most simple prayer. In a way, it may be the first prayer recorded in Scripture of someone presenting to Jesus. They have no wine. And she left it there. She left it there. We know she left it there because of this fascinating dialogue that follows. Do you know what happens next? Jesus said to her, woman, now that's a respectful term here. Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. And his mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. What do you make of that response? What does this have to do with me? It seems to me that the intention of Jesus when he went to Cana was not to perform a miracle, that he went to attend the wedding. He had yet to perform a public miracle. We'll read that later. And he did not go to Cana with the intention of performing a miracle. My hour has not yet come. Boy, is this getting relevant. A sincere request is presented to Christ. Christ did not intend to respond to it. So already we have the possibility of an unanswered prayer. My hour has not yet come. Have you ever taken a request to God, left it there, sensing that there's nothing going to happen, nothing's going on? Is he listening to me? What does Mary do? Does Mary cross her arms? Does she tap, tap, tap her feet? Does she, you know, point at the clock? Does she remind him we're running? What does she do? She has taken the problem. She has walked it across the room. She has presented it to Christ. He says, my hour has not yet come. Mary then turns to the servants and she says, whatever he says, you do that. I take that to mean he's in charge. I'm not. I take that to mean my job was to take the problem to him. I trust him. She carried the problem across the room. She presented it to him, and she said, whatever he says, that's what I want. Prayer is not so much asking God to do what you want. It is more asking God to do what is right. Prayer is asking God to do what you want. Nothing wrong with that. 
But prayer is most of all saying, God, whatever you want, that's what I want. That kind of prayer touched Jesus, didn't it? Now think about this. If it is true that he came to Cana without the intent of performing a miracle, if you've read the rest of the story, you know that he performs a miracle. If you haven't read the rest of the story, let me tell you what happened next. Jesus said to the servants, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out, take it to the master of the feast. And they do. They take the water pots full of water, they remove some water, they take it to the master of the feast, he takes a sip of it, and he says, whoa, this is good stuff. Most people serve their good wine at the beginning of the wedding. You have saved the best until now. This isn't that cheap Mad Dog 2020 they serve at the convenience store. You're wondering how a preacher knows about Mad Dog 2020, aren't you? But this is good. And he is impressed with the quality of the wine. John, the gospel writer, makes careful note of the quantity of the wine. Six stone jars filled how full? To the brim, overflowing. Quick calculation here tells us that six stone jars full of water results in, hang on to your hat, 903 bottles of wine. 903. They could have opened their own wine store. Good wine, abundant wine. When Jesus answers a prayer, it leaves a good taste in your mouth. When, I get, when we give our problems to Jesus and ask him to solve them, everyone is blessed. There is a cascading sense of blessing that comes. Everybody gets in. The family does, the party does, generations do, a nation does. Because she took her problem to Jesus first. Here's the question. What prompted Jesus to perform the miracle? Do you think he knew that there was a scarcity, a paucity of wine before he was told by Mary? I kind of have a feeling he did. What prompted his action? The only thing that happened between the absence of the wine and the presence of the wine was the request of Mary. Could it be that your simple prayer, your simple request could prompt such heavenly action that it would literally change the flavor of the situation? in an an, an abundant way. I think this story is in the Bible to help us understand that when we pray, God responds. That when you speak to God, dear child of God, God listens. I do believe there are certain things that we cannot change. I think God's character is immutable and our prayers will never cause him to be anything but a good God. I think we could pray for decades and we will not change the need that each of us have for a Savior. The outcome of history is always going to be twofold, heaven and hell. There will always be a judgment day. There are certain things that are set, that are fixed in eternity that we cannot change. But there are other things here in the lower level, on the lower plane, Your family will be healthier because you pray for your family. Your business will be better because you're giving God your business. Your marriage will be stronger if you continue to give your problems 
to Christ. Why? Let me tell you why. Because you are a blood-bought child of the one true king. You're not just anybody. You are a child of God. And when you come to God, you call him daddy. You call him father. You declare you are good. And he welcomes you into his presence. You're an ambassador of Christ. You may think, oh, I just sit in a cubicle and do my work, or I just drive a bus, or I don't have a big, important role. Hey, hogwash. You're a child of the one true king. You're an ambassador of Christ. And when the ambassador speaks on behalf of the king, the king listens to the request of the ambassador, and he is equipping you. He has placed the presence of his son in you so much so that you feel these promptings in your heart. You are communing with the source of light and life itself. I believe that there is more good wrought because of prayer than any of us can ever imagine. And the devil himself wants to keep you out of prayer because he knows, he knows that when you pray, you are activating some forces in heaven And when you do what Mary did, when you take your problems and you present them to Christ, it doesn't depend on your eloquence. You don't have to have a certain language or skill or capacity. You don't have to be in a certain place or wearing a certain type of clothing. You don't have to have a certain level of seminary training. That God hears the simple heartfelt prayer. And never, never, never are you more powerful than when you're coming to Christ in the name of Christ and saying, I need your help. Here's an idea. What if you did what Mary did? Some of you have some parts in your life where the pieces aren't fitting. Let's imitate Mary. Will you do this with me? Just cup your hands out in front of you. Just cup them out in front of you. Okay, you know that problem, that part of your life where the pieces aren't fitting? Just place it right there. Maybe you can reduce it down to a sentence like Mary did. There's something about reducing our problems down to a sentence that strips them down to size. Mary said, they have no wine. You're saying, I can't meet payroll. You're saying... I don't think I'm going to meet that deadline or I don't get this quiz or my husband is cranky. Listen to me. If it matters to you, it matters to God. Okay. All right, here we go. Let's give it to him. Lift it up. Lift it up. Lift it up. Okay, now let it go. Lower your hands. It's not yours anymore. You don't carry that problem by yourself anymore. Something supernatural just happened. The economy of your world just changed. There is an activity now in heaven involving God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yes, even the angels. In the response of the Holy Spirit in the saints, the lives of the saints that know you, you're going to receive blessings. You're going to receive encouragement. Will Jesus respond as quickly to you as he did to Mary? Maybe. Maybe you will see a sudden response, six water pots full of blessings. Maybe you'll have an overflow of answered uh, questions. Maybe you'll go to bed thinking, oh, wow, why didn't I think of that? Or somebody will come into your world and say, oh, here's an idea. Or maybe it will happen even before you put your head on the pillow tonight. I hope so. But sometimes God takes his time. Sometimes part of the answered prayer is the development of our character, teaching us to trust. But don't interpret the absence of a response as the absence of God. You have done what God told you to do. You have taken your problem. You have lifted it up to him. Now, here's your assignment for this week. 
Every time you have a problem, you just give it to him. Every time. You know when you're having a problem. You can feel it in your neck. You can feel it in your stomach. You can feel it in your jaw. You can, your friends can see it in your eyes. Every time you have a problem, would you do that? Would you, before it gets a hold of you, would you give it to him? You say, Max, if I give a problem to Jesus every time I have a problem, I'm going to be talking to him all day long. Here's what the apostle said. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about what? Everything. Tell God your needs and don't forget to thank him for his answers. If you do this, you will experience God's peace, which is far more wonderful than the human mind can understand. And his peace will keep your thoughts and hearts quiet and at rest as you trust in Christ Jesus. In this society so marked by panic, we are in need of a people of peace. In this society that is so framed in fear, we are in desperate need of a quorum of a family of faith. The world needs you to be at peace. People of panic make foolish decisions. But people of peace, people who believe that there is a good God, people who believe that the throne of heaven is occupied by a loving Jesus, people who believe that God is never afraid and God is never in doubt, even when we're afraid or we have doubts, people who believe that, they are people of peace. And you can be that person. You can be that person at your work. You can be that person in your cul-de-sac. You can be that person in your classroom. You can be the person who walks in in the fragrance of Christ, not even needing to speak, but you have that demeanor of peace. Because unlike most people, you've given all your problems to him. The big ones and the small ones. And he hears when you pray. Not because you are eloquent. Some of you are. But because he is faithful. Helen Rosevear was a missionary in the Congo for 20 years. She served at a medical clinic in the remotest part of the jungle, right on the equator. During the fourth year of her service in the Congo... A mother came to her about to give birth to a child, and she was experiencing problems in childbirth. The mother already had a two-year-old daughter. During the childbirth, the mother passed away. The baby was born prematurely. Helen Rosevere feared for the survival of the baby because they had no incubator, they had no electricity, they had no way to keep the baby warm. She instructed for the midwife to go and fetch a hot water bottle. The midwife came back with the news, we only had one hot water bottle and it burst when I tried to fill it. Dr. Rosevere left the baby in the care of the midwife and said sleep with the baby to keep the baby warm. But she had no solution. She didn't know if the baby would make it. Every day at the orphanage adjacent to the medical clinic, there was a prayer time with the children. And so Dr. Rosevere shared with the children, the orphans, the story of the baby who had been born the day before, the baby who had a big sister but no mother. There was a 10-year-old girl by the name of Ruth who, upon hearing the story, said, well, doctor, we need to ask Jesus to help. We can ask Jesus for a hot water bottle. 
Dr. Rosevere almost stopped the girl from praying because in order for that prayer to be answered, it would require a miracle because beyond anything she had ever seen. They were on the equator. Who would send a hot water bottle to the equator? And she had been there four years and yet to receive a single delivery in four years. Yet what do you do when a child wants to pray? Who's going to ever tell a child not to make a request? Dr. Rosevere, years later, remembered still the prayer of 10-year-old Ruth. Ruth prayed, please, God, send us a water bottle. It'll be no good tomorrow, God, as the baby will be dead. Please send it this afternoon. While you are at it, would you please send a doll for the little girl's sister so she'll know you really love her? Dr. Rosevere brought the assembly to a close and went back over to the clinic. Later that afternoon, wouldn't you know, a truck appeared, a delivery truck. The delivery man left a brown wrapped, a, a box wrapped in brown paper tied up in string on the porch. Dr. Rosevere went out and she began untying it. And the children appeared from all directions. She opened it up. And even as she was opening it, she said, the tears were beginning to form in my eyes. And when she looked into the box, she found bandages, jerseys, raisins, sultanas, <laughs> and a brand new hot water bottle. And next to the hot water bottle, a doll for the little girl's sister. The box had been shipped from a Sunday school class five months earlier and arrived that day. The same God who heard that prayer of little Ruth, the same God who heard the prayer of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Would you hear me, dear child of God? He has heard your prayer. He has heard your prayer. He loves you. And you're not in this battle alone. You're not carrying your burdens alone. He cares deeply about you. You can cast all your cares upon him because he cares about you. Will he answer as quickly as he did with Ruth and with Mary, the mother of Jesus, again? I hope so. But I do know this. He will do what is right, and he will do so in the right time and in the right way.